I'm here at the ASCO meeting in 2018, and I'm chairing a session on the role of imaging and the treatment of bone disorders in multiple myeloma. At this session, there are three talks. I myself am going to be talking about the use of imaging modalities in the plasma cell dyscrasias. Uh, plasma cell dyscrasias are uh, essentially uh, a growing problem in uh, patients as they uh, age. Uh, right from MGUS to small rim myeloma to multiple myeloma, the incidence and prevalence of the problem is increasing. And we have a lot of new imaging modalities, and there's always been a dilemma on how to best incorporate these in the initial workup and follow-up of patients with these various plasma cell dyscrasias. Uh, there are uh, guidelines that have been published by the International Myeloma Working Group and European guidelines in this regard. Actually, the International Myeloma Working Group will probably be updating the guidelines soon. But at this session, we'll, we'll uh, talk about what the state of the art is. As far as uh, uh, the, the various plasma cell dyscrasias goes, uh, in uh, monoclonal gammopathy of unknown significance, it is felt that for low-risk patients who have a low power protein, that perhaps no imaging is necessary. That may change in the future based on IAWMG guidelines that may be published. But it is at the moment felt by most that for the low risk, we could just uh, refrain from uh, exposing patients to unnecessary radiation. But for the high risk uh, patients, that uh, at least a whole body CT, or if not available, a uh, skeletal survey should be considered. Um, for those who have a smoldering myeloma, uh, there we need to actually establish whether patients truly are smoldering or whether they have, based on modern uh, uh, imaging techniques, actually got multiple myeloma because uh, recently the diagnostic criteria for multiple myeloma were changed to incorporate both uh, MRI and PET-CT scanning. So in that population, the use of these modalities to uh, classify the patient is uh, growing. Um, whether these uh, need to be repeated at certain intervals is a question that hasn't been addressed in current guidelines, but maybe uh, in the next in International Myeloma Working Group uh, guidelines be something that will also be uh, addressed. Um, for patients who have a multiple myeloma, uh, obviously the initial staging of the patients, again, uh, with a whole body CT is preferable if not a skeletal survey. Uh, the use of PET scanning certainly is prognostic, and the question is whether it should be done for all patients. And certainly in the context of clinical trials, it is encouraged, but it is, I think, a little bit uh, controversial if everybody should have a PET CT scan done. Um, again, uh, for patients who, uh, once they start treatment with myeloma, especially those who undergo a transplant, there is data that uh, PET CT scanning at the 100-day point post autologous transplant has prognostic influence. Um, and that, again, is a reason why some physicians do recommend it already. But at the moment, what we lack is any definitive uh, guidelines on how to use the test in terms of tailoring therapies from that point on. So I think that, uh, again, there is no uh, data right now that uh, uh, tells us that uh, this is a must, but I think increasingly we will see this being incorporated into routine clinical practice, especially if the updated IMWG guidelines uh, suggest so, and uh, there is likelihood uh, that they may actually suggest serial uh, PET CT scans for those who are still positive at the point 100 days post uh, transplant. Um, for the routine follow-up uh, surveillance of patients, uh, again, for patients with multiple myeloma, uh, there's no consensus on whether uh, imaging at set intervals is uh, something that should be undertaken, but certain uh, physicians and the NCCN uh, also do advocate for the use of yearly uh, skeletal surveys or whole body uh, CT scans. As far as patients at time of progression, uh, there is uh, very little data on the use of the more novel imaging tests. The use of PET CT scans, however, in that area is growing. And though one lacks data, I think a lot of physicians, including myself, are using that information often to tailor therapy in frontline uh, progressors. 
And for those patients, we usually, I, my own algorithm, which again I must admit is not universally uh, agreed upon, is that for those who have no PET CT evidence of disease and are biochemical progressors, I'm more apt to use less intensive uh, modifiers at that time, often use elotuzumab or ixazomib, whereas those that have uh, got a PET CT scan that is positive, even in the absence of symptoms or other conventional CRAB criteria, I'm more inclined to give a more aggressive uh, treatment regimen, often including drugs like daratumumab and kyprolis. However, again, this is my own personal algorithm and may or may not be something that everybody may agree upon. And another area I think in imaging that we literally lack any uh, systemic data about is the use of uh, PET imaging in patients with a highly refractory multiple myeloma. And there I think uh, actually its utility even already is tremendous. The fact is that even for those who have secretory disease and have a blood paraprotein, about a third of patients at some point uh, become either non-secretors or they develop clones that are at least partial non-secretors and just following the blood work often gives a false sense of security. And there often a PET CT scan is the only reliable test that allows us to uh, see if our patients are responding. So I think that again, this is an area where there will be new guidelines coming forth, but at our session we are uh, reviewing what the state of the art is and also some of the controversies that exist in this area.